Hey everybody, I'm going to read to you a lot out of this book. It's called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, Harriet Jacobs. So these are true life uh, moments from a lady, a young lady who was a slave uh, in the United States. This first chapter is called Incidents, it's called Seven Years Concealed, Life of a Slave Girl, Childhood. I was born a slave, but I never knew it till six years of happy childhood had passed away. My father was a carpenter and considered so intelligent and skillful in his trade that when buildings out of the common line were to be erected, he was sent for from long distances to be head workman on condition of paying his mistress $200 a year and supporting himself. He was allowed to work at his trade and manage his own affairs. His strongest wish was to purchase his children. But though he several times offered his hard earnings for that purpose, he never succeeded. In complexion, my parents were a light shade of brownish yellow and were termed mulattoes. They lived together in a comfortable home. And though we were all slaves, I was so fondly shielded that I never dreamed I was a piece of merchandise, trusted, them for, trust, trusted to them for safekeeping, and liable to be demanded of them at any moment. I had one brother, William who was two years younger than myself, a bright, affectionate child. I had also a great treasure in my maternal grandmother, who was a remarkable woman in many respects. She was the daughter of a planter in South Carolina, who at his death left her mother and his three children free, with money to go to St. Augustine, where they had relatives. It was during the Revolutionary War, and they were captured on their passage, carried back, and sold to different purchasers. Such was the story my grandmother used to tell me but I do not remember all the particulars. She was a little girl when she was captured and sold to the keeper of a large hotel. I have often heard her tell how hard she fared during childhood, but as she grew older, she, can, she evinced so much intelligence and was so faithful that her master and mistress could not help seeing it was for their interest to take care of such a valuable piece of property. She became an indispensable, indispensable personage in the household officiating in all capacities, from cook and wet nurse to seamstress. She was much praised for her cooking and her nice crackers because so became so famous in the neighborhood that many people were desirous of retaining them. In consequence of numerous requests of this kind, she asked permission of her mistress to bake crackers at night after all the household work was done, and she obtained leave to do it, provided she would clothe herself and her, friend, her children from the profits. Upon these terms, after working hard all day for her mistress, she began her midnight bakings, assisted by her two oldest children. The business proved profitable, and each year she laid, laid by a little which, she, which was saved for a fund to purchase her children. Her master died, and the property was divided among his heirs. The widow had her dower in the hotel, which she continued to keep open. My grandmother remained in her service as a slave, but her children were divided among her master's children. As she had five, Benjamin, the youngest one, was sold in order that each hair might have an equal portion of dollars and cents. There was so little difference in our ages that he seemed more like my brother than my uncle. He was a bright, handsome lad, nearly white, for he inherited the complexion that my grandmother had derived from Anglo-Saxon ancestors. Though only 10 years old, $720 were paid for him. His sale was a terrible blow to my grandmother. But she was naturally hopeful, and she went to work with renewed energy, trusting in time to be able to purchase some of her children. She had laid up $300, which her mistress one day begged as a loan, promising to pay her soon. The reader probably knows that no promise or writing given to a slave is legally binding, for according to Southern laws, a slave being property had can hold no property. When my grandmother lent her hard earnings to her mistress, she trusted solely to her honor, the honor of a slave, slaveholder to a slave. To this good grandmother, I was indebted for many comforts. My brother Willie and I often received portions of the crackers, cakes, and preserves she made to sell. And after we ceased to be children, we were indebted to her for many more important services. Such were the unusually fortunate circumstances of my early childhood. When I was six years old, my mother died. And then for the first time, I learned by the talk around me that I was a slave. My mother's mistress was the daughter of my grandmother's mistress. She was the foster sister of my mother. They were both nourished at my grandmother's breast. In fact, my mother had been 
weaned at three months old, that the babe of the mistress might obtain sufficient food. They played together as children, and when they became women, my mother was a most faithful servant to her white foster sister. On her deathbed, her mistress promised that her children should never suffer for anything, and during her lifetime she kept her word. They all spoke kindly of my dead mother, who had been a slave merely in name, but in nature was noble and womanly. I grieved her, I grieved for her, and my young mind was troubled with the thought, who would now take care of me and my, my little brother? I was told that my home was now to be with her mistress, and I found it a happy one. No, no toilsome or disagreeable du duties were imposed upon me. My mistress was so kind to me that I was always glad to be to do her bidding and proud to labor for her as much as my young years would permit. I would sit by her side for hours, sewing diligently, with a heart as free, free from care as that of my freeborn white child. When she thought I was tired, she would send me out to run and jump, and away I bounded, to gather berries or flowers to decorate her room. Those were happy days, too happy to last. The slave child had no thought for the, for the morrow, but there came that blight which too surely waits on every human being born to be a chattel. When I was nearly 12 years old, my kind mistress sickened and died. As I saw the cheek grow paler and the eyes more glossy, glassy, how earnestly I prayed in my heart that she might live. I loved her, for she had been almost like a mother to me. My prayers were not answered. She died and they buried her in the little churchyard where day after day my tears fell upon her grave. I was sent to spend a week with my grandmother. I was now old enough to begin to think of the future, and again and again I, I asked myself what they would do with me. I felt sure I, would, I should never find another mistress so kind as the one who was gone. She had promised my dying mother that her children should never suffer for anything. And when I remembered that and recalled her many proofs of attachment to me, I could not help having some hopes that she, had, she would let me free. My friends were almost certain it would be so. They thought she would be sure to do it on account of my mother's love and faithful service. But alas, we all know that the memory of a faithful slave does not avail much to save her children from the auction block. After a brief period of suspense, the will of my mistress was read and we learned that she had bequeathed me to her sister's daughter, a child of five years old. So vanished our hopes. My, my mistress had taught me the precepts of God's word. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do you do ye do ye even so unto them? But as I was her slave, and I suppose she did not recognize me as her neighbor, I would give much to blot out from my memory that one great wrong. As a child, I loved my mistress, and looking back on the happy days I spent with her. I tried to think with less bitterness of this act of injustice. While I was with her, she taught me to read and spell, and for this privilege, which so rarely falls to the lot of a slave, I bless her memory. She possessed but few slaves, and at, the de and at her death, those were all distributed among her relatives. Five of them were my grandmother's children and had shared the same milk that nourished her mother's children. Notwithstanding my grandmother's long and faithful service to her owners, not one of her children escaped the auction block. These God-breathing machines are no more in the sight of their masters than the cotton they plant or the horses they tend. So that was chapter one in Incidents of a Slave Girl, Harriet, my Harriet Jacobs. Um, hope, you like the hope you like this video. Uh, please like, subscribe, and message. Thanks for listening.